infrastructure or it has lab? Okay, welcome back everyone and for those of you just joining us, welcome. My name is Dr. Devin Singh. I'm Dr. Alex Kabiri and we're here to talk about the existence of UFOs, sightings of identified floating objects. Uh, this will be part one of two. Uh, you know, when somebody comes in complaining of floaters, which is very regular, a very regular occurrence in all offices, um, sometimes you also have, though, somebody who comes in with floaters that doesn't complain of them because they know what their experience was with their primary doctor. They've been getting headaches, they've been feeling funny, they go in and say, I'm just here for my routine check to see what the doctor finds. They don't want to bias the doctor, right? And then the doctor says, ah, you have high blood pressure and your blood sugar is high or, or you're deficient in some vitamin or all of the above, right? So they bring that experience and expectation sometimes to the eye doctor. They're seeing floaters, they're seeing maybe flashing lights, uh, spots, what have you. And they don't tell you. They want to see what your exam finds because they don't want to bias you ahead of time. Now, if you think of it like that, that there are some folks out there who walk in with and put that expectation on us, it makes us see this in a whole different light. The extent to which you have to look at the back of the eye, the extent to which you just tap people on the shoulder and say, hey, you look great, we'll see you in two years when your voucher kicks in. You know, it, it makes you rethink all that because there are folks that have walked in, I, I'm sure of it, with a problem, and if they didn't complain and nobody took a good look, they walked out with the same problem. You know, that, that un unfortunately was positioned maybe to progress and set them up for some sight threatening outcome. Uh, so again, UFOs, unidentified floating objects, part one of at least two. And here we go. Right. In this talk, you know, we'll see that oftentimes, you know, our focus tends to be on the anterior segment or retinal pathology. We tend to skip or ignore the vitreous. We think of this as this inert structure, but we'll see it's actually fairly complex. And a lot of different changes can occur in various parts of the vitreous. Now, a big part of this is how we see the vitreous. Is it this gelatinous blob that has a role in the uh, development of the eye embryologically, but then it's just kind of a nuisance afterwards that leads to the complaint of floaters? Or does it have a role in terms of uh, being a vehicle for inflammatory cells and inflammatory material to migrate through? Does it have uh, some some uh, significance in terms of allowing us to observe the vitreous or examine the vitreous and get a better idea of what's happening in the posterior segment even before dilating the patient. Or if we were not even planning to dilate the patient on that day, can we still take a quick look at the anterior part of the vitreous through an undilated pupil and say, oh, I see some cells. Oh, I see some, some uh, possibly blood cells floating or possibly you know, pigment particles floating that would suggest to me I need to take a better look back there today. Uh, so, getting back to the anatomy, anatomy of the vitreous, gelatinous mass composed of 98% water, the remainder is primarily glucose, hyaluronic acid, and collagen. Uh, it accounts for 80% of the globe volume, but we, for the, in, in many instances, it's easy not to pay attention to it at all until somebody starts to complain. And if they don't complain, well, you know, no, no real attention goes to the vitreous. And it's amazing too that although it's 98% water, it's also two to three times the viscosity of water. Um, and this viscosity is meant to serve a few purposes. One is to add rigidity to the structure of the eye, because imagine if it's taking up 80% of the globe, it's contributing for the most part to the rigidity of the globe. And because it's also viscous, it has to press up against the retina, the optic nerve, the posterior side of the lens, the ciliary body. And we're going to see in a few moments how the vitreous base and the cortex, the cortex is the outer layer of the vitreous. In this image, it's really out here. It interfaces with the retina and also with various other ocular structures. So if we understand a bit about the anatomy of the vitreous and some of the slight differences in the properties of the vitreous as we move from, let's say, central vitreous to cortical vitreous and then all the way forward toward the vitreous base, we kind of have an idea of what we should be looking for or where we should be looking depending on, on the patient's complaint. Sometimes that can help us focus our exam a little bit. Because in addition to understanding 
what are vitreous floaters and what are the ideologies, it's helpful to understand the anatomy. Um, so starting off with the vitreous base, the vitreous base is actually a circular ring that originates on the posterior side, it's just posterior to the aura serrata, which is in this image right over here and up here, and wrapping all the way around in a giant circle, it extends all the way to the ciliary body. So is there any neurosensory retina within the area of the vitreous base? A portion of it is, yes. The, the very, very edges of the peripheral retina by the aura serrata um, is adjacent to the vitreous base. It comes in contact with the vitreous base. So that's really kind of the, the limit to which peripheral retina extends? Correct. Okay. And the vitreous fibers within the base, they adhere strongly to the basement membrane of the non-pigmented epithelium of the cellular body and the internal limiting membrane of the peripheral retina. And why this is important and it makes sense too is when we talk about a vitreous detachment, why do we call it a posterior vitreous detachment as opposed to an anterior vitreous detachment? Um, because the vitreous base is so strong adhered to the other structures of the eyes, it's very rare to see a detachment of the vitreous in the anterior segment. Uh, the vitreous cortex, which is the outermost layer of the vitreous, is directly adjacent to the retina. It only encompasses maybe 2% of the total volume of the vitreous. But this is where we have the interface with the retina. The, the vitreous cortex also is composed of vitreal cells, such as halocytes, fibrocytes, and glial cells. Glial cells, as you know, act as a supporting structure for neural tissue. Within the retina, the Mueller cells are glial cells, which help anchor down the vitreous to the internal limbic membrane. Now, this, it, this, uh, the, the interaction between the uh, vitreous cortex and, and its attachments, uh, as we'll see, can lead to some of the things that we commonly see, such as retinal holes, retinal tears, epiretinal membranes, vitreal macular traction, uh, macular holes, things like that. And as we mentioned before, the, the, the vitreal cortex is weakly attached to the internal limbic membrane of the retina, particularly in certain areas. For example, a parafoveally, uh, the optic nerve, and the aura serrata in particular. <coughs> now, the central vitreous, which is the visually significant portion of the vitreous, is, consists of a very, very much smaller amount of collagen compared to the vitreous uh, cortex. It's less viscous. It also has less cells. It also contains the remnants of the hyaline artery that was present during uh, fetal development. And this anatomy makes sense because in order for us to see through the vitreous, it makes sense for this portion to be less constituents of collagen and other tissues. Now, interestingly, we're going to talk a little bit later. Uh, when patients complain of seeing vitreous floaters, it's in this part of the vitreous these floaters are present. Now, you know, I have heard one, uh, one concept that I, I learned while talking to a retinal uh, specialist friend of mine, uh, that being that the vitreous is mostly water, and water is a great conductor of temperature. That's one reason that, for example, even though you're in the cold, and let's say your face feels cold, your eyes don't really feel cold. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So, you know, I, I, I'm, I have not looked into that fact at all to see what the... the ocular surface temperature is in the cold or the, uh, you know, vitreous temperature is in, in, in cold temperatures. I, I haven't looked into that, that at all, but uh, that idea was presented to me and in, in a way it seems to make sense. And now we're going to talk a little bit about the different sites in which the vitreous cortex and the retina adhere to each other or attach. Um, as we had mentioned before, that includes the aura serrata, um, the optic disc margin, parafoveally, uh, the posterior lens capsule, this circular attachment is also called the Weiger's ligament. Uh, the vitreous is also weakly attached to certain retinal vessels in the mid-periphery. And this is a helpful way to understand it because there's a lot of pathology that can occur when this site of attachment occurs anomalously, for example, with an anomalous PVD, no. which we're going to talk a little bit later. Yeah, because I, I know that we were all taught that uh, if you see any sort of vitreous hemorrhage, you have to really, really, really look 
hard and see if there's a retinal tear. Uh, and if you don't see one, well, it's there, but you missed it. That's the way that a lot of us were taught. Uh, you know, we have seen exceptions where there was a there was a posterior vitreous detachment that did trigger a small vitreous hemorrhage. And, you know, still just to be careful, we sent those patients to retinal doctors and I would still do the same thing, send them to the retinal specialist, you know, assuming that there's a small tear that I missed that led to the, to the hemorrhage. But in each of those instances, uh, the report has come back from the retinal specialist that the vitreous hemorrhage was part of the process of the formation of the vitreous detachment. Right, especially, you know, if you're seeing a vitreous hemorrhage and you're suspecting it's due to a posterior vitreous detachment, and the patient has no history of diabetic, rop, diabetic retinopathy or any type of retinal vascular occlusions, um, we can assume that this blood is originating from the retinal vasculature. Oftentimes in the periphery, we'll see lattice degeneration, core retinal scars. These are also areas of abnormal attachment of the vitreous cortex to the retina. So now we're going to talk a little bit about the sources of vitreous floaters. Um, the most common vitreal sinuresis, which is a degenerative breakdown of the hyaluronic collagen network that exists within the vitreous. Um, the collagen network slowly begins to liquefy. Uh, the collagen releases water and the protein molecules begin to clump together to a size that becomes visible to the patient. So I think one thing that we don't want to do is to try and lump all possible causes of uh, vitreous floaters into that first bracket of normal process of vitreous synoresis. Uh, you know, we, we don't want to start asking the patient if they say at the end of the exam, at, at it's not a convenient time, you've got the chart closed, you're ready to walk out the door, move on to the next patient in the next room. And they say, oh, by the way, you know, I've been seeing this little kind of dot floating around and when I move my eye this way, it goes this way. And when I move the other way, it goes the other way. You know, it, it, you don't want to fall into the trap of just saying, oh, uh, did you get hit in the eye or have a hard fall or anything? No. Did you see flashes of light at all? No. Have you been seeing it for a long time? Well, yeah. Is it, is it new or were there any changes? No. The same spot I've been seeing for a while. Yeah, you're probably fine. Don't fall into that trap. That's, uh, that's where we can get in trouble. Remember, you get in trouble for either actively doing the wrong thing or neglecting to do the right thing. And that would count as a scenario where the doc neglected to do the right thing by trying to lead the patient down a road that empowers uh, the doc to take a position of inaction. Right, because this vitreous synoresis may exist by itself or it could be within the spectrum of pathology that will, the patient is not predisposed to. Right, I know I've had patients who complain of a floater and when I just take a quick look uh, at the anterior vitreous, I don't see anything like pigment or blood cells or anything. I take a look with the undilated, you know, uh, looking at the fundus at the slit lamp, 78 or 90 lens, and you see a PVD sitting there and you say, well, I found a sign, they have a symptom, the two match, there's no need to go any further. It's easy to do that too. I say, don't do that. Let's dilate that patient and let's take a look and see. And you may be surprised by what you find. There is such a thing uh, as a state of having a pre-tear as well. And we'll talk a bit about what that can look like. Right, which, you know, leads into our next possible ideology, which is a retinal tear or detachment. Um, if the tear results in a hemorrhage or release of pigment or cells into the vitreous, if it's significant enough, patients will notice them as floaters. Um, for our younger patients complaining of floaters, it can be due to a persistent remnant of the hyaline artery. Um, in natural embryonic development, the hyaline artery begins to degenerate over time. But sometimes, you know, nature is not perfect. It'll leave these little remnants floating in Cloquet's canal, which, as you mentioned, is right in the central vitreous, which is in the person's uh, line of sight. Um, asteroid hyalosis is another interesting one. Well, I'm, I'm sure we've all seen plenty of cases of asteroid hyalosis. Most of the patients I see don't really complain of vitreous floaters. They might, they might complain sometimes under certain conditions. They might complain of, uh, of reflections as well, or little sparkles in their vision. Um, but again, they're, they're not coming in complaining of some acute, you know, when I wiggle my eye one way, this little spot goes one way, and when I move my eye the other way, it goes the other way. It's, that's not the complaint. And for academic purposes, we mentioned here that there is some association between uh, having diabetes and having asteroid hyalosis, particularly in cases where it's bilateral. Um, some studies support the association, some studies don't. But it doesn't hurt to ask the question. It doesn't hurt to ask the question, right. 
Uh, we mentioned before vitreous hemorrhage. We uh, interestingly also macular edema can cause these symptoms of similar to vitreous floaters. Right. We I had a patient the other day with a very well circumscribed area of uh, macular edema, and uh, he was able to say that you know when I look straight, I see the dark ring uh, ahead of me. Right. So and depending on the what you have in your office, if you have a patient with vitreous floaters, but you don't see anything significant in the vitreous itself, and you're confident you've taken a very thorough look, it might be worthwhile to do a macular OCT. Or if you don't have one in the office, there's no shame in, in sending them out for one, and you should know who, to, who you can co-manage with, which other eye care providers you can co-manage with uh, that are near you. Right. And also, too, you know, as we're, we're going to talk a little about later, um, you know, OCTs are very valuable too if you're trying to look for any vitreal macular traction. Um, in patients who've had a history of posterior uveitis, they might have fibrosis in the vitreous, very large floaters as well. So it may be worth to inquire about a possible history of, of uveitis. Sure. Um, some of the risk factors for floaters, um, top of the list there is myopia. If patients have had a history of cataract surgery, um, if they've had a history of a YAG capsulotomy, any history of uveitis, as we mentioned before, or history of injury. And um, if you can think of any examples yourself, um, please mention them in the chat. Does anyone, any of the doctors listening in or watching, can think of any other risk factors that will predispose a patient to complaining of vitreous floaters? Maybe intraocular foreign body, that could. I guess that would go in line with injury. Yeah. You know, myopia is a funny one because some there there are some folks who think myopia control is very valuable, and there are some folks who think that there's no point because when they get to a certain age, they can do their LASIK or clear lens extraction, what have you, and uh, you know significantly improve their vision. Uh, and then even if it progresses a bit beyond that, well, it'll never be like it was before. You know, but here we're seeing that. With as a risk factor for, for myopia, where you have the eyeball sort of elongating and stretching in one direction, you have the vitreous gel kind of uh, shrinking in on itself, you know, in the opposite direction, and there's a bit of a risk of this tug of war that can lead to, you know, an increased risk of tears and, and uh, you know, sight, sight uh, threatening outcomes. So if you look at it from that end, there is possibly some value in myopia control if, uh, if, if you can find an appropriate candidate and uh, implement appropriate strategies of control. It's a very good suggestion. Also in, in patients with a history of cataract surgery, any type of intraocular surgery, you're physically disturbing the contents of the eye. Um, by shaking up the vitreous, you're altering you know, its adherence to the retina. And oftentimes, you know, we, we've seen in practice plenty of patients who will develop a PVD after cataract surgery, vitreous floaters after surgery, or also you'll have patients who have pre-existing vitreous floaters, but they just can't see them because they have a dense cataract. They become aware of it after cataract Obstructing surgery. It. They become more aware. Now, you know, as we talk about the aging of the vitreous, um, a posterior vitreous detachment is when the posterior portion of the vitreous cortex um, separates or no longer adheres to the sensory retina. Um, what happens when this doesn't happen properly? What happens when the vitreous liquefaction, what happens when it outpaces the weakening of the retinal adherence? So we have this change to the vitreous, but it still remains attached to the retina. In that case, we're gonna develop traction Depending on which part of the sensory retina this traction occurs, we may see some of the following. Um, you might get vitreal macular traction, um, epiretinal membrane formation, um, macular edema, or worse, macular holes. Um, if we have traction at the optic disc, you'll develop something called a vitreal papillary traction syndrome. Um, if the patient develops chronic bleeding, they may be at risk of neovascularization of the optic disc. So if you look at it this way, and we look undilated and see a patient has a bit of an epiretinal membrane and we can think that this, this is a possible mechanism that's contributing to the formation of the uh, epiretinal membrane. There's no rule that says this mechanism cannot contribute to other sequelae as well, depending on exactly what's happening where inside the eye. 
Could they have peripheral retinal issues or mid-peripheral retinal issues that uh, might go unnoticed if we don't dilate? If we just stop at, oh, well, your vision's 20, 25, but I see why, because you have a mild ERM, not a big deal, we'll catch you in six months. If this is the first time you're seeing that, that epiretinal membrane, not a good way to go. They, they should be dilated. I mean, it makes sense to assume that this anomalous interface is not occurring in just a single location, that it has a potential to affect the peripheral retina as well as you just mentioned. Um, if this anomalous attraction attra is occurring over a retinal blood vessel, you may get a retinal hemorrhage, or if it drips into the vitreous, you may have a vitreous hemorrhage. In the peripheral retina, as you just mentioned, your patients are at risk of tears, attachments, or white without pressure. So the question then becomes, when we're assessing the posterior segment, how do we decide whether we're looking at you know, benign vitreous floaters, or is there some anomaly that we need to rule out? Right, so well, is, is what, it, what are our tools and techniques that we're gonna to use to assess the posterior segment, which we're gonna talk about? And now this, this next section is interesting, and it was, it was, it was interesting to work on, and it's, it's gonna be interesting to, to hear for, for many folks, because in many instances, we learned the mechanics and the techniques of how to do an eye exam in school. And in some instances, when it comes to how we look at the back of the eye or how we assess the angle, maybe some of us have not, you know, really spent a lot of time doing that and experimenting with other methods of doing that. So we still try and use the same tools, in some cases the same equipment that we used while we were in school 20 years before. You know, you know sometimes uh, folks still pick up a direct O-scope and take a look at the back of the eye. That has value, sure. Sometimes people say, well, let's look at the anterior vitreous and pick up a 78 or a 90 lens and look at the, the posterior pole. And if there's nothing real happening there and they're not complaining, we let them go. That, that posterior pole assessment has value. It's limited value though, and we'll see why. Uh, some folks try and, and say, well, you know, I put my BIO headset on, I have the patient lie down or I sit them up, I raise the chair, lower the chair, I get in a half squat position. I have the patient, I hold my arm way up in the air and have them look at my hand over here while I shine a bright light in their eye and they can't really see my hand properly after that. Uh, and and maybe, maybe you do all that, but there are limitations there for some folks um, that have to do with what quadrant of the eye we're looking at, that have to do with uh, ambidexterity, you know, patient fatigue, doctor fatigue as well. Uh, there, you know, there, there are different things. Maybe you have an injury and you can't do a particular technique but now you need to have other techniques you can go to. Uh, there are var various lenses we use. I think very commonly we see a 20 or a 28 diopter lens. Some folks have 14 diopter lenses or other lenses they use to get a good look at the back of the eye with BIO. Um, eye drops, the common ones, tropicamide, phenylephrine, cyclopenylate, homatropine, paramid, or combinations of the above. Paramid itself is a combination product. Uh, tropicamide plus phenylephrine is a common, uh, is a common uh, combination that'll be used in many offices. Cyclopenylate works pretty well as a standalone. Um, you know, so these are these are some of the common things that that uh, we'll see as far as tools. All right, that we're going to see too that you know each tool and technique has its benefits, has its pitfalls. Um, in our profession, we're all going to gravitate towards a particular way in which we'll use it visually, but we'll also see that because no particular technique or tool is perfect, we'll we'll have to waver outside of our comfort zone with managing the posterior segment. And we're gonna review some of the pros and cons of non-contact phonoscopy in addition to contact phonoscopy. With non-contact phonoscopy, we're, we're familiar with the net adopter lens, the 78, some of us will use the 60, and they're very convenient, which is why we'll oftentimes use them habitually, but sometimes it can be a trap for us as the examiner. And particularly because the view with each of these lenses will be limited. So some folks, you know, might say, "Well, I have the, you know, I was I was uh, in one practice for for maybe a year or so with another OD who said I, I never do BIO, I never do contact fundoscopy, I only do 78 at the slit lamp dilated with the patient dilated, and he he had this claim that he could see out to aura in every direction." And, uh, it, you know, I, I think that's impossible. It, it's, uh, it just doesn't make sense. Even the lens manufacturers will tell you that's not really possible to, to get a good view out to, out to Aura in, uh, in, 
every instance. You know, it's not it's not uh, it's not possible. It's not really a reliable thing to 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 do. Uh, BIO, you know, the basic principles of BIO that allow it to work so well. Um, you know, you have you have a nice light source. You have a condensing lens. Uh, your pupil beautifully well dilated. Very cooperative patient. Nice wide aperture. Interpapillary aperture is nice and wide. Uh, they're able to hold their gaze very steadily. Doc is able to hold very steadily and get a good repeatable view of what they're looking at. But there are instances where you might send a patient out and draw a lesion at 10 o'clock and the retinal doc will say, yep, I did, I did laser at 8 o'clock or I did laser at 12 o'clock, <laughs> you know, not quite where you drew it. And you think, but it was there. And then you'll look again and it's not quite where you thought it was. So there is some variability there. Uh, it's nice if you're sending somebody out for, for a consideration for a procedure that you and the person that's doing your follow-up visit or your surgical evaluation, that you, it, it's nice if you have a chance to see the same thing the same way. Now, before we go any further into discussing the differences with the different lenses and also going into contact fundoscopy, we'd like to know from the doctors that are viewing, when you're dealing with patients complaining of vitreous floaters, you know, what is your go-to approach for identifying changes in the posterior segment? Do you all have a preference? And if you have a preference, what is your reasoning for using it? Um, please leave your thoughts in the chat section, and we'll resume in about two or three minutes. Yeah, so please let us know, you know, what's your preferred method for looking at the back of the eye? Including your preferred, uh, your preferred, you know, de device or lens type, it's, it's nice. As each lens, different lenses have different magnification and different fields of view, and some are better suited for looking at certain structures. Um, please share. Okay, great. So by and large, the feedback we're getting is, you know, most of our doctors will use either a 78 or a 9 diopter lens or use that in conjunction with a 20 diopter lens to obviously get a better view of the periphery and mid-periphery. Um, if we're suspecting macular changes, right, we'll incorporate Amsler grid. Now, when we're at the sit lamp, so some of our lens choices, are going to be either a 60 diopter lens, a 78, a 90, or an even newer lens is a 90 diopter wide field. And as the diopter increases, we have a loss of magnification, but with an increased uh, static field of view. And with all these lenses, you know, keep in mind that what you're looking at is inverted and mirrored or reversed. So when you're doing your drawings, you have to account for that. Also, if you're getting a report from the retinal doc, or if you're doing an exenophthalmoscopy, that's important too when you're documenting. So we see, you know, based on the image here, um, the example here used is if you're using the 78, for example, um, without having the patient 
move in different gazes, you're, you're pretty much limited to the central retina and up to maybe the mid-periphery and maybe just past the mid-periphery if you've got a well-dilated pupil, the patient's very cooperative. But you know, any changes that going on outside of the zone, you're gonna miss. And again, these are, these are under ideal conditions. You know, great, great positioning. Uh, if the patient has a bit of a cataract, especially some degree of a cortical or a posterior subcapsular cataract, when they start moving their eye left, right, up, down, the, you're going to lose some degree of your image. Sometimes it'll get completely washed out in certain directions of gaze. Also, if you have patients with really significant asteroid hyalosis that's in the visual axis, you're really going to have a limited view as well. Um, with indirect ophthalmoscopy, specifically our 20 diopter lens and 28, um, you have an even smaller field of view, but with greater magnification. And it's more like shining a spotlight in right. a park when you're looking for changes. And we see here that our view is also very limited. And if you, if you say, well, I have my, my friend has a 14 diopter lens, great. There is a smaller field of view with a greater magnification. Right. And with this particular lens, you know, you're going to have to span out into the mid periphery. And you can think there are, there's a potential to miss changes. Sure, I mean, let's say, let's say that you're looking at the inferior portion of the fundus and you're standing in front of the patient, you tell them to look down towards their knees or down towards the floor, you know, part of their eye tucks under their, uh, their, their dilated pupil, tucks under their lower eyelid, and that part of that view can be lost. But the same goes if you have an elderly patient who can't really look superiorly very well. Your views of the superior retina can also be limited to Sure. Unless you're able to squat really far down. So here we come to this, this concept of contact fundoscopy, right? And I think we all bought three mirror gonio lenses when we were in school. And probably most of us tried contact fundoscopy using the three mirror lens a couple of times while we were in school. But rotating the lens round and round and round. Uh, you know, instability of view as the lens wobbles, ha having to having gaps in our in the segments of the retina that we're, that we're viewing, uh, you know, and having to rotate each of those lenses, one all the way around for mid periphery, the other one all the way around again for peripheral retina. Um, I, I think that it's it became a bit inconvenient sometimes to where many of us maybe didn't do it and we just went back to BIO and slit lamp ophthalmoscopy. Uh, so why do we? But if if we look at Retinal laser lenses, laser lenses that the retinal doctor might use to fix the lesion or the tear or what have you that you're sending the patient there for, these are all contact fundus lenses, right? They're laser lenses. Now, before they start using the laser, well, they're using it as an examining lens to find the lesion and then, you know, apply the laser. And then, you know, set, stop the laser and again examine the area that was lasered to make sure that they've, you know, done a, done a good uh, barricade. If, if that's what they wanted to do. So the concept of, well, if it's good enough for, the, for these guys to fix it, which means if it's good enough for them to have a good, to not miss anything for one, to have good stability of their positioning to where they could apply, apply a laser treatment if they wanted, good stability of the patient positioning to where the patient's comfortable enough and can sit still there long enough for them to get a good look or do a treatment even and then get another good look afterwards, then it's probably something that we should have uh, and, and it's good enough for, for me to go ahead and, and look for some of these lesions. And I'll tell you, since we got contact uh, fundus laser lenses um, in the office to use as examining lenses, I mean, there's, there's been no going back for us. You know, it, it's, uh, we don't pick up the headset too often these days. Uh, you know, some reasons that colleagues I've talked to, you know, one, well, I don't want to make the patient uncomfortable by having that gooey gel in the eye. Uh, you know, I don't have those things in the office. I have a BIO, I don't have a laser lens. Um, you know, doctor's comfort, physical comfort, doctor's, uh, you know, maybe individual mental comfort with the idea of doing contact fundoscopy again. Um, and then doc skill level, right? I mean, contact fundoscopy, if your reference point was three mirror lens, you know, for, to look at mid peripheral and peripheral retina, and you haven't done it in 20 years, well, then there might be an issue with comfort and skill level there. But uh, like anything else, if you really practice to, to do your best, you will. And if you have appropriate tools, like a nice contact fundus lens, that you, laser lens that you don't have to rotate, you can just put it on and with minimal tilting of the lens in each direction and minimal 
uh, you know, instruction of the patient to move your eyes a tiny bit to the left, tiny bit to the right, little up to the right, little down, whichever direction you're interested in, you can really get all the way out to aura uh, within, I'll say, less than a minute, maybe 35 to, to 35 seconds to a minute for each eye. Yeah, you're right, yeah, honestly, using a, a contact lens to examine the fundus, you can actually take less time than pulling out your 7890 followed by doing BIO. And, you know, we're going to show you that the benefits of doing contact fundoscopy oftentimes will, you know, outweigh the hurdles that we mentioned here. You know, doctor's comfort level, skill level, worries about patient comfort. So when we talk about contact fundoscopy, we're physically placing a lens on the surface of the patient's eye for the purpose of performing a retinal exam. Or a retinal specialist ophthalmologist will be using the same lens for doing the laser therapy. Now there are different. There are many different ones. There are lenses that go out 100, uh, 130 degrees, 160 degrees, 180 degrees, 170 degrees. You know there are different different types of lens. But keep in mind, there's a relationship between field of view and magnification. So the greater the field of view that you have, less magnification. The smaller the field of view, the greater magnification. So. You know, our choice was to try and hit the sweet spot with both, get a lens that still allows good magnification and with minimal manipulation would allow us to get out to the periphery. And for us, that turned out to be the, a 160-degree a lens. Right. And when we talk about field of view and we're comparing the field of view of different lenses, we're talking about the static field of view, meaning not having the patient look in any particular direction. Patient is fixated on one point and the doctor is doing all the manipulation with the lens or with the light beam. Um, we're all familiar with the three mirror gonial lens. Um, we, all, we know that we'll use the bullet mirror for assessing the anterior chamber, particularly the ir irritocorneal angle. Um, but we also have two other mirrors on that lens that oftentimes go unused. The mid-sized mirror located over here relative to the bullet mirror, normally it's to the left. It gives us a nice view of the aura serrata, um, ciliary body. And also with the very larger mirror, we'll have a similar view, plus a little bit more of the uh, mid-periphery of the retina. But the downside of this lens is you have to rotate it in order to assess all 360 degrees of the peripheral retina. And the center of the gonial mirror, which is also a ruby lens, gives you a good view of the posterior pulp. So you have one lens here that could allow you to see everything, but you do have to rotate all around uh, twice to get, to get a good look at the mid-peripheral and peripheral retina. So it's a very useful lens, plus the fact that most of us probably still have it from when we were in school, as opposed to the laser lens we're going to talk about. But again, the one downside is you have to manipulate the lens. And I think rotating the lens around twice, you know, for each eye, it can be a little bit hard mentally to, to, to remember every lesion that you saw. And some people, especially the, the people that you're concerned about having mid-peripheral or peripheral retinal changes that could be sight-threatening, they, you know, the high myopes and folks like that, people with a history of trauma or prior ocular surgery, they will have noteworthy findings. And it can be a little bit hard to keep track of all of them or very time consuming to keep stopping, take the lens off, make some notes, come back, put the lens back on, continue your exam. It can be not uh, time efficient to do it that way. So contact fundoscopy again, tools and techniques, lens commonly used or lens commonly thought of as is uh, in, within optometry, a three mirror gonio lens. Um, it's probably not very commonly used for the factors that the reasons that we mentioned. And again, why we or I, you know, use uh, retinal laser lenses to do posterior segment examinations. Again, if it's good enough for the retinal doctors to use as an examining lens slash treatment lens and then post-treatment examining lens again, uh, it's probably good enough for me to find it. You know, I want to make sure that if I say there's, a, there's something that might need treatment at 10 o'clock, I want to make sure that when he looks, he's going to see it at 10 o'clock. So if I use the same type of lens that he's using, well, I just I have a chance that we're seeing the same thing the same way. All right, both you and the surgeon are going to have the same view of the retina, um, same orientation, same level of magnification. You'll be able to describe it similarly. Um, patients don't have to move fixation. I'll have the patient, you know, focus on my ear. Um, you can adjust your view by adjusting the light beam. You can have a thick beam, a long beam. 
sure. short and wide beam. And you can sweep the entire retina that we see in this image here. You can do all of this in under a minute, honestly. Yeah, you really can. And that's with the person having significant noteworthy findings. Still, a minute tops, you can get everything You don't have done. to rotate the lens. You don't have to reapply the lens for different views. You know, and there are things that you can do with, with, with contact fundoscopy that you can't do the same way with, uh, with indirect ophthalmoscopy. Such as, you know, I've, I've seen, for example, a very shallow operculum, and mm -hmm. I wasn't sure, is this just a spot, or is this a small operculum? And I was able to, to move the beam a little bit, to wiggle the beam a bit, and see a tiny shadow mm -hmm. of the shallow operculum. And because you don't have to move the lens and you're not using the spotlight, you can be more confident that you're not missing anything in the shadows, so to speak. Sure. You don't have to worry about your beam as you're sweeping missing anything. And you know, it, it's, uh, we, I, the, the concept that, oh, I don't want to make the patient uncomfortable, um, while it's a valid concern, patient comfort, you know, and make sure that whatever examining or, or treatment procedure we're doing, that it's, it should be well tolerated by the patient, uh, in many instances, in every instance that, that we have done, which is thousands at this point of exams like this, um, you know, people appreciate that they've never had such a, such a thorough exam where they know that they're leaving confidently knowing that they either have a problem that, that should or could be, need to be fixed or that they're A-OK. -okay. The lens that, you know, we're, we chose to talk about in this talk, the uh, Super Quad 160, again, we selected because it's a, it's a good balance between the level of magnification and the amount of retina that can be viewed. There are lenses that can go out 270, 180 degrees. Now that we, now since we have, uh, since since we made this uh, choice to do, you know, laser lens contact fundoscopy, newer, less expensive models have come to the market. There are now what are called disposable retinal laser lenses that go 180, 170, 160, 130 degrees. Uh, you'll get them in a pack of 10. They might cost you 130 bucks instead of a lens like this that's not disposable that might cost you, you know, between eight and nine hundred dollars. You can get a 10 pack. If you have high risk patients, well, you dispose of them. If you don't have high risk patients, you know, some folks are saying that they can be cleaned and reused as long as you don't drop or abuse them. So if, if you're not sure if this is something you want to get into and you don't feel comfortable spending 800 bucks on a quote unquote permanent lens, you could get, you know, a 10-pack and experiment for a little while and, and uh, see, you know, how this changes the way you do an eye exam and, and changes your office flow as well. Right, and then um, with the exception of the disposable lenses, um, these contact fundoscopy lenses are maintained and cleaned just like you would you're going with your mirror. Um, in terms of when you're actually examining the patient, you know, keep in mind that you know, patients will fatigue when their head is kept in the slit lamp and you may lose view of the superior retina first. So you want to start with the superior view. Correction, you'll, you'll start with the superior view, but you're looking at the inferior retina because right. the images are mirrored and inverted like they are with our other ophthalmic lenses. You know, when you get more proficient in terms of pro positioning the patient, your, your exam is very time efficient. It's taking no more than a minute. It doesn't really matter where you start from, you know. Like now, I start inferior lens, superior retina, because I'm more mostly concerned about possible sight-threatening finding than the superior retina, uh, and my technique is good, so I don't get bubble formation in the top part of the lens, which will later obscure my vision of the inferior retina. But early on, when you're first starting, it's not a bad a bad tip to start uh, with the superior lens. There's also a contact lens called the Aris Centrales, which is used for lasering the posterior pole. It's a great lens to use yourself if you're looking for subtle signs of macular edema, vitreo macular traction. Microaneurysms, um, microaneurysms. And neurovascularization. You see somebody who's had, uh, they've had a BRVO, you know, they've had laser already, and you're not sure if within those areas of laser there's new, there are new neovascular changes happening. Well, this is a nice lens to use to slap on the eye and take a look uh, at what's happening. And again, the goal is here is you want to get the same view that the retinal specialist is looking at. And there are other contact fundoscopy lenses out there for evaluating the macula. Um, that's just our lens of choice, again, for field of view and uh, magnification. 
Um, but again, there are disposable lenses that you can uh, get a 10 pack of for maybe 120, 130 bucks made by other manufacturers. You would just have to search disposable uh, fundus laser lenses and uh, you'd be able to see. Also, you know, we share with you the lenses that we've experienced using. If you guys have any experience with any other contact fundoscopic lenses, please share with us, you know, in the chat. Um, ultimately, your preferred examination method are going, is going to be based on various factors. When you're looking at your patient, you have to assess their ability to maintain a certain posture for a certain period of time. You want to make sure they're comfortable and they can sit and be stable. You want to be time efficient. You want to give the patient the best chance to identify potential pathology. And you also want to make sure you have a very clear, stable view of the vitreous, uh, peripheral, mid-peripheral retina. You want to be confident that you haven't missed anything in the posterior segment of the eye. Sure. You know, we, we, uh, I can share with you an interesting case that we saw within the past month where we had a gentleman who had no complaints, no floaters, no flashes, but he was a new patient to us. So I wanted to make sure I had a good understanding of everything he had uh, that could potentially be sight-threatening to him. So I did this, this type of uh, fundus examination, and I did notice that in the far periphery, he did have an area that was not torn yet, but it was tented up as, and as if there was some, some contraction there, some traction there, but no uh, tear as of yet. So, you know, we said this, he's in a state of pre-tear. Uh, and that he possibly, you know, he, he's likely going to have a tear at some point. He might benefit from being considered for maybe a little prophylactic laser. We did send him to somebody within a week. We said, you know, a week is for a week, should be fine. When he got to that appointment, he had a tear. There was no detachment, but there was a tear by that point. So it it's, uh, just goes to show that had we not done such an exam and told him, you know, everything looks good because we weren't able to see quite that far out and everything looks fine, great, and then within a week he gets a tear uh, and has to have treatment, you know, I think that would have made us really look bad. That's right. why I just had my eyes checked a week ago. Right, you were able to catch an impending tear and treat it promptly. And the other thing we want to mention too is, you know, because you're having a binocular view with a contact endoscopic lens, you're able to appreciate the three dimensions. Absolutely. Absolutely, in, in all directions of, uh, of gaze, all directions of, of fundus uh, viewing. So, you know, we want to propose a scenario to those of you that are watching. Let's say you have a patient where two weeks after cataract surgery in their right eye, they started complaining of a sudden onset of shadows and spots in their vision. Um, their measured acuity is 20-20, the anterior chamber after two weeks is not quiet. Um, you look at the anterior vitreous with your slit lamp, you see some cells and, and some pigment as well. Um, you don't see any tears to the capsule, no vitreous prolapse. Um, you do a dilate exam with your 20 diopter lens, but you can't see anything. Um, at that point, well, what do you do? Um, do you have a, what is your differential diagnosis? Will you try an ulterior method to assess in the posterior cavity? And what are your thoughts? We'll give you all viewers watching online a, a few minutes to answer. I can tell you some of my thoughts if I'm seeing pigment in the anterior vitreous, I'm concerned about a renal tear, uh, vitreous hemorrhage, renal hemorrhage. Absolutely. I, I mean, that... that pigment and those vitreous cells are from somewhere and just because you know examination method a uh, didn't reveal it doesn't mean that there's no further exam to do yeah. and you know it's it's again for that reason that it's valuable to have multiple uh, tools in your arsenal I mean we have different ways for examining you know for assessing for example the refractive state of a patient we can do an auto refractor we can do retinoscopy we can, you know, take their old glasses and throw that in the phoropter. There are many ways we can get a refraction started with the patient, right? We can just even just start from scratch if, and just say, okay, looking at the big letters, is this better or worse? If we go in a plus or minus direction, then add some sill, you know, JCC and refine things, binocular balance and refine things. There are multiple ways that we can go to try and assess the refractive state of a patient. 
but in many cases we still have one way which is not really you know the the best way of assessing the posterior segment yeah I can tell you from personal experience there are plenty of circumstances where um, having only access to a 20 diopter lens I assess the posterior segment but I'm still concerned that I may have missed something and I'm honestly much less concerned if I have used a contact lenoscopic lens such as the 160 or if I don't have that access to that 2A gonial lens. And having inspected the posterior segment with a contact lens, I'm much more confident when I don't see anything, that sure. nothing is there sure. at the moment. Sure. I, I absolutely agree. I mean, we've been doing this for years, and it's, uh, it's, it's something that overnight changed the way that we did our job. Okay, we're, we've approached the end of the talk. We want to thank all of you for listening in. Um, we will stick around for another few minutes. If you all have any questions about this talk, or if you have any questions about the previous talk on follicular con conjunctivitis, we welcome it as well. And keep, keep in mind, you know, we're never, you're never done. We're never done improving. That's why it's called practicing, right? We keep trying to to practice what we envision as being the, the highest standard of practice. Uh, and if you keep maintaining an, an honest pursuit of that, you will get better. You, you will definitely get better. Uh, if, if you feel like, wow, my ocular surface exam is very good, my understanding and my management of the ocular surface is very good, my understanding of the posterior segment is good, but my examination technique is a little bit limited, I only have one trick up my sleeve, well, you can add something else. Here's something very, very safe that you can add up your sleeve that uh, that will really help your patients and make your job fun in terms of examining the back of the eye. And an inexpensive way to get started is to uh, maybe look at disposable contact fundus laser lenses. Uh, get a 10 pack of those and uh, you know give give those a try and, and right, see. before investing in yeah, more before spending like eight, nine hundred bucks. Right. Yeah. Also, just a little bit of housekeeping, just to remind all of you, um, this is a live webinar. But in order for you to get credit through. Arbo and to get these COPE approved credits as live, um, please answer the questions in the attached exams and forward them via email to ce at myodce.com. Uh, thank you all again for listening in. We will have more talks in the future and we hope to have all of you attending again. Um, my name is Dr. Devin Singh. And I'm Dr. Kabiri. It was great having you guys. And uh, just really quick, if you know anyone who's going to want, because replays will be available, we'll make that known uh, through, through our website and by email where the replays will be available. If you have any, any colleagues that uh, want to watch these after the fact and uh, get credit, they won't get live credit because there's no live host to interact with. They can still get distance learning credit by viewing the, uh, the video and uh, submitting the uh, questions back to us. Of course, they'd have to email us at ce at myodce.com. We would then send them the, uh, the slides and the questions and they'd have to send them back to us. Right, and for those of you who are watching live now, depending on your jurisdiction, you will get credit as a live course. Um, one of our audience members you know, mentioned a uh, good point that with contact lenses, yes, they need to be disinfected. Um, the disposables don't provide as good of optical quality. Um, ultrasound as a good option. I mean, ultrasound, you'll find very large changes to the retina, such as um, a neoplasm, retinal detachment. But the ultrasound resolution, chances are, will not be able to pick up vitreo retinal traction. I don't think anyone's going to do ultrasound and come back with a diagnosis of retinal holes at 10 o'clock. I don't think that's going to happen. Right. So an ultrasound would be more appropriate if you're concerned about a retinal detachment or a mass. Right. I mean, there are toxal lesions out there. There are things, you know, out there that, uh, that we should be looking at and, and identifying and advising patients and following them up accordingly. Right. A nice thing, too, is with contact endoscopy, this is something you can do in the office without sending the patient out first. Okay, thank you all again for your questions. Um, we're going to be closing the talk now. Um, if you have any questions or concerns after we end the webinar, feel free to email us. So a quick, quick point about disposables not providing as good optical quality. Uh, you know, my understanding is that when they're new, the first view is good. 
as long as they are not mishandled, the first view is very good. Subsequent views, the quality degrades. That's my understanding, and that's probably the same way with daily disposable contact lenses. It's one way of enforcing compliance, right? So, my but my suggestion is not that you get some disposable lenses and use the same one for months and months on end, and then go to the second one, and then your ten pack lasts you ten years. That's not the suggestion. It's before you spend eight to nine hundred dollars on a permanent lens by whichever manufacturer you want that gives you whatever field of view that you want. Uh, that you have a less expensive way to maybe get comfortable and experiment with the concept if you so choose. Okay, everyone. Good night.